The meeting of the Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education will now come to order. We'd like to welcome all the people in the audience who have joined us. And I'll just tell you, we go on till about 10, 10.30. So you're welcome to stay if you want. <laughs> and this evening we have Mr. Kurt Henschke, who is a fourth grade teacher at Rucker School, and some students from Rucker, and they are going to lead us in the flag salute. All right, so I'm gonna say a few words so you don't have to stand up yet, okay? Uh, these beautiful kids come from Rucker, and I'm proud to be their advisor. Uh, Ms. Anderson couldn't be here tonight. She had foot surgery, and she could not find a tow truck to bring her in, so. <laughs> okay, I'm warming them up for you guys, okay? Then I got it. All right, but these, uh, these kids represent our student council and our spirit club. They meet every, well, they take turns meeting on Wednesdays at lunchtime. They do all the Rucker Way character counts assemblies, the monthly assemblies. They put them together and put them on, and they do a fine job. They have two service projects during the year. One of them is to gather food for the needy around Christmas time. We deliver them to Rucker families who are in need. And the second one is a uh, coin drive that they do during the month of caring. And so they collect coins. Uh, they call it, you guys ready? Caring Cougars Collecting Coins to Conquer Cancer. So we've just finished that up. The bank's counting our coins, and we will donate it to cancer charities that are near and dear to the Rucker community. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to these beautiful kids. If one of them says Cougars Up, this is what she means. Our sign for ears up and our mouths closed, it's our kind of pay attention sign. So are you ready, dear? All right, go for it. I'll move that down just a little bit, and I'll come over here. Good evening. My name is Aria, and I am the Student Council Sergeant in Arms. Please, please join us in three pledges, beginning with the Ple Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Buenos noches. Mi nombre es Ciclali Bucio, y yo soy vice presidente del Club Yesivico de Rocker. Por favor, acompáñanos en tres janeamentos, comenzando con el janeamento a la bandera. De pie, por favor. Listos? Comenzamos. Good evening. My name is Calista Rapman, and I am the Spirit Club Vice President. Please join me in the Rocker Way Pledge. Cougars up. Please repeat after me. I will be safe. I will be safe. I will be courteous. I will be courteous. I will do my personal best. I will do my personal best. Good evening. My name is Trinidad, and I am the Spirit Club Vice President. Please join me in the Rucker Spirit Club Pledge. Cougars up. Please repeat after me. I promise to model the Rucker Way Pledge. I promise to model the Rucker Way Pledge. I promise to model the six pillars of character counts. I promise to model the six pillars of character counts. I promise to be a friend, not a bully. I promise to be a friend, not a bully. I promise to be an upstander, not a bystander. I promise to be an upstander, not a bystander. Thank you. You may be seated. Hay alguien más que necesita intérprete para la junta? Thank you very much. Gracias. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. We have several recognitions this evening, and I'd like to start with the first recognition, which is the Rotary Club of Gilroy. So I'd like to ask the president, Marco Ranella, to come forward. Thank you, Marco, for coming and representing the Rotary. 
I'm, uh, as you know, a Rotary member, and I'm very, as, as well as Jaime, I'm very pleased to be able to do this recognition tonight. Um, it's a, a big part of, of uh, my adjustment to Gilroy, I could say, as joining Rotary. It's been a really important part of my life. So let me give you a brief overview of Rotary Club. Rotary was chartered in 1925 and currently has a membership of about 120 men and women representing a diverse cross-section of local businesses and professions. The club meets every Tuesday at lunch for fun, fellowship, and informative programs that cover topics of local and global importance. Rotary is an, Gilroy Rotary is an organization working to make our community a better place for all. They provide grants, scholarships, and donations in support of a wide variety of community needs. Gilroy Rotary endeavors to make friends and contacts and more, more importantly, to make a difference. This year, Rotary donated $30,321 to the district for various programs, including events, supplies, technology, musical instruments, books, and more. And I also want to mention in the 10 years that I've been in Rotary, and Jaime's been there a lot longer, they do that every year. This is not a one-shot deal. So it's in the 25 to 30,000 range every year. So just think of how that's added up for many, many years on behalf. And luckily, the list is up there so you can see it. So we are extremely grateful for the donations because each one makes a difference and a lasting impact on, on our programs for not only our current students, but for our future students as well. So Marco, we'd like to pre present you with a plaque. And maybe at a Rotary meeting, we could also talk about it. And I'll read what the plaque says. The Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education proudly recognizes Rotary Club of Gilroy. The numerous, dona the numerous donations to support students, teachers, programs, and learning have truly made a difference in our district. Thank you for your invaluable commitment and continuous support presented this fifth day of May 2017. Thank you very much. Yes, <laughs> you don't have to stay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our next uh, recognition, I believe we have a number of people from Rod Kelly I see, so why don't you all come up? We want to recognize Rod Kelly Elementary. So obviously Principal Marissa Saucedo is here. We have students too, cool. Great, and parents, wonderful. Thank you all for coming. Well, we're here to recognize Rod Kelly for receiving the California Association for Bilingual Educators, we call that CABE, 2017 Seal of Excellence Award. The Seal of Excellence Award was inaugurated in 1966 to honor exemplary bilingual biliteracy programs throughout the state. This prestigious award honors schools that have established effective programs for their English learners and bilingual learners. In order to receive the award, the school must meet certain criteria, and I'm gonna read that off just because I think it's important that you, you realize, and it's in several categories. The first is comprehensive and enriched instructional program, including ELD. And for Rod Kelly, the Rod Kelly teacher, they had to talk about these things on their application. So the, the statement that was on there said, Rod Kelly teachers collaborate to ensure that all standards are taught and this year, a plan was to develop to incorporate designated ELT, ELD. I'd just like to comment, I think the collaboration at Rod Kelly is in large part the reason why they've received so many awards. The teachers really work well together. It's a model school when it comes to collaboration, among other things that I could name, but I'll <laughs> stick to the application. The second is a proof of a professional development plan and how staff use research-based instructional strategies. And at Rod Kelly, what was stated in there is teachers are all trained in thinking maps, whole brain teaching, AVT from Kate Kinsella, and how to use formative assessments. And then the third area, an effective homeschool community collaboration 
that empowers parents to become active participant in their child's education. And stated on their application, Rod Kelly has an amazing parent club, ELAC and Project to Inspire Parents, that help build the community and family-like feel that we have at Rod Kelly. Along with receiving the award at the Kabi Conference, which a number of you attended, we were honored to have members of Kabe, including Chief Executive Officer Jan Gufsosun, I can never do that, Korea, come to the school last Friday where they presented the award. By the way, the entire school was there. All the students were sitting on the NPR floor and all the teachers. And they presented the award to the whole school along with special pins and buttons acknowledging their accomplishment. It was really neat assembly, something they started this year and uh, several of us were there. It was really fun to watch that assembly and have the students and staff, everyone, recognized for this accomplishment. So we're really proud of you, and we were going to play the video, but I found out it was almost five minutes long, so we're not showing it. Yeah, so sorry. It was a great video. <laughs> sorry, but anyway, we have a plaque for you, too. Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education proudly recognizes Rod Kelly Elementary School. Recipient of the prestigious Seal of Excellence Award from the California Association of Bilingual Education, we express our sincere gratitude for the invaluable contributions towards student academic achievement, dedication to the dual immersion program, and commitment to the education of English learners presented this 20th day, oh, well, it was going to be presented on April 20th. We couldn't get the plaque changed, but anyway, <laughs> it's presented tonight. So I'll give it to Maritza, but congratulations to everyone for doing a great job. Thank you. Is this from Kabi? Yes. Oh, oh great. This was presented at the uh, ceremony, so we wanted you to see this too. Very nice. So can you, I don't know, can you get us all in? <laughs> Somebody from Rod Kelly should hold this, not me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. No? One more. At, <laughs> at, our, at, our, at our last board meeting, you know we recognized two of our three uh, second round employee recognition award recipients. So we did two of them at the last meeting. We, uh, a third person couldn't be the, here that evening. So tonight I'd like to recognize uh, Gilway Federated GFP, our GFP award recipient, Susan Childers. And Maria, and I think the person who nominated you is here, right? Mm -hmm. Great, good, thanks for coming. Okay, so we're really pleased to recognize Susan uh, this evening uh, as a representative of G GFP. Susan began her employment with the district um, in, on August 18, 2010, as a paraeducator for special day class at Gilroy High. And in Jul July 2015, she moved over to Solar Sano and has been there ever since. Education specialist, a special day class teacher, Jenna Gutierrez, submitted Susan's nomination with the following information. Susan gives her heart to our students. Working with special education students, Susan, Susan has the patience of a saint. She does not need direction while working. Susan foresees what the students' needs are and adapts her support accordingly. Susan offer new, new, offers new ideas for the classroom 
based on lessons I'm teaching, Susan will bring in, I'm having trouble talking tonight, manipulatives or supplies that she purchases to help students learn. For example, a plant lesson, she bought plants for the students to grow. She also comes up with ideas to make school a safer place. She stays after school to add de decorations to the classroom. Susan is a very hardworking mom in and outside of the classroom. Susan, on behalf of the district and the Board of Education, we thank you for your hard work and your diligence, and I've actually seen you a number of times in the classroom. It's really great to be able be able to acknowledge all your hard work tonight. So we have a plaque for you. Actually, I keep saying that. We created this really cool. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what you call them, but anyway. <laughs> Trophy, Gilroy Unified School District Employee Recognition Award. We were gonna do it on April 20, 20th, so presented to Susan Childers. And thank you so much for all your hard work on behalf of our students. That concludes our recognitions. We have something very special on our agenda. Uh, we have resolution number 161753, Day of the Teacher, which is May 10th, 2017. And I'm going to read the resolution and then we'll do a roll call vote. Gilroy Unified School District resolution 161753, Day of the Teacher, May 10th, 2017. Whereas California long ago recognized the immeasurable value of our teachers and has designated the second Wednesday in May to be Day of the Teacher, a special observance that honors teachers and the teaching profession. And whereas the Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education wishes to express its appreciation to our teachers and certificated staff for their creativity, dedication, talent, and hard work and Whereas teachers and other certificated staff are valued and essential to the educational achievement of the students of the Gilroy Unified School District and whereas no other profession touches as many persons with such a lasting effect and whereas Californians everywhere have stories to share about how it was a teacher that inspired them to strive, to attain, and to succeed in life and Whereas certificated staff fill many roles as listeners, role models, motivators, mentors, and work to open the minds of their students to ideas, knowledge, and dreams. And whereas teachers and other certificated staff encounter students of widely differing backgrounds and support them all equitably with compassion. And whereas it is appropriate that teachers be recognized for this dedication and commitment to educating their students. Therefore, be it resolved that the Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education and the superintendent do hereby highly commend and extend sincere gratitude to all certificated staff and be it further resolved that the Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education hereby acknowledges May 10th, 2017 as Day of the Teacher in recognition of outstanding support and commitment to the students of the Gilroy community. Passed and adopted this fourth day of May 2017 and we will have a roll call vote.
Yes. B.C. Doyle. Yes. Mark Good. Yes. Pat Midgard. Yes. James Pace. Yes. Linda Paceno. Yes. Jaime Rosso. Yes. The next item on our agenda is also a resolution, and Ms. Pisano will read this. This is Resolution 161754. This is Classified Employees Week, which is May 21st through May 27th, 2017. And the resolution reads, whereas the week of May 21st through May 27th, 2017 has been designated as Classified School Employees Week throughout California, and whereas the Gilroy Unified School District employs hundreds of classified employees who perform services which are vital to the educational process, and whereas classified school employees are rarely in the spotlight, but are always central to the activities of our schools, serving with professionalism and dedication, and setting a high standard for care and compassion. And whereas classified employees support and enhance the educational process by assisting instructors, transporting students, preparing nutritious meals, maintaining buildings and grounds, implementing and maintaining technology, and performing all technical, business, clerical, and secretarial functions. And whereas classified employees provide the Gilroy Unified School District with specialized skills and contribute to the educational excellence in our schools and programs day in and day out. And whereas classified employees provide services that enable the Gilroy Unified School District to respond effectively to the needs of students and their families, teachers, administrators, and other staff, and the needs of the greater community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education and Superintendent extends its sincere appreciation and commendation to the Gilroy Unified School District classified school employees and proclaims the week of May 21st through May 27th, 2017 as Classified School Employees Week. Passed and adopted, hopefully, this fourth day of May 2017. Thank you. And I will entertain a motion for this resolution. Move approval. Second. Roll call vote, please. Heather Bass. Yes. B.C. Doyle. Yes. Mark Good. Yes. Pat Midgard. Yes. James Pace. Yes. Linda Paceno. Yes. Jaime Rosso. Yes. Thank you. And my apologies, we have to go back and have a motion and a second for the day of the uh, certificated staff to approve. Move to approve resolution 161753. Second. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Did we do it twice? Sorry. Yes. B.C. Doyle. Yes. Mark Good. Yes. Pat Midgar. Yes. James Pace. Yes. Linda Paceno. Yes. Amy Ross. Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, next we will en uh, entertain a motion for approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. The next part of our agenda has to do with general public comment. At this time, members of the public may address the board on any item or an issue within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board that is not listed on the agenda. Members of the public may also address the board on an agenda item before or during the board's consideration of the item. No action can be taken on an item not on the agenda at this time, but may be referred to the administration or put on a future agenda. In accordance with Board Bylaw 9323, individual remarks will be limited to three minutes each unless otherwise stipulated. And Ms. Paceno will, will help with this and time your comments. I will time the comments and I will also, uh, at two and a half minutes, give you a heads up. So the first speaker is Rachel Kogan and the second speaker would be Freda Kogan. Right over there.
Hello, my name is Rachel Kogan and I am a junior at Christopher High School. I was recently the victim of a hate crime committed by two Christopher High School students because I am openly LGBT on campus. On three separate occasions, the two, the two different attackers attempted to hit me with their cars, all while calling me faggot, while biking the route from my home to school. The first two attacks were committed on my way home, and the third attack was committed on my way to school. I entered the administrative office about two minutes after the third attack to report it to the school administration. I was very clearly in distress, but there was not one person designated to wait with me until my parents arrived. The school administration left me alone in a room after a major trauma, and never in my life have I felt more isolated. Since my perpetrators were not suspended from school and I was terrified for my safety, the school begrudgingly agreed to have a campus supervisor follow me. That, my only shred of security, was taken away from me after one day. I was left alone like a lamb to a pack of wolves. I was left to fend for myself. Gilroy Unified School District's treatment of victims is absolutely deplorable. Not only was there no legal support since the school and their police officer were finding every reason to pardon my attackers, but there is no protocol to, to provide emotional support for victims of hate crimes. Though the, through the entire process, the school administration has made me feel isolated, unappreciated, and insignificant. I was not offered counseling or any other services to help me cope with the trauma that I had experienced. You may not think that this is the school's issue, but I was a victim of a hate crime that could have been preventable if it were not for your apathy. Thank you. Freda Kogan, and after Freda would be Kathy Johnson. Good evening, I'm Freda Kogan, and that was my daughter, Rachel. I'm coming to address you today to ask why the board representatives did not respond to my three emails I personally sent regarding my child being a victim of three hate crimes at CHS, inviting you to partner with me to fix the situation. I'm a voter. I counted on the school board elected officials to care about, my to care about the children of GUSD. I sent e three emails, and the head of LGBTQ in San Francisco, Maribel Martinez, sent two. I got your email addresses off the GUSD website. I sent the emails to Patricia Midgard, Linda Pacino, Heather Bass, B.C. Doyle, Mark Good, James Pace, and Jamie Rosso. Not one response. Not one. My husband's a high-tech security engineer in the Valley and confirmed you received all five emails in total. I could never understand why parents get litigious, why they lawyer up. I get it now. With every unanswered email, you feel like you're a victim of the system. Apathy breeds contempt. Our school has no GSA, no unity, no information regarding tolerance or inclusion, what bathroom can be used or cannot, no consequences for hazing or hate crimes, it's the Wild West. I was giving tons of excuses as to why the school district's hands were tied. I worked within the system to validate and empower my child, who has severe depression and PTSD after the attacks. All I asked for was some sympathy, understanding, maybe returning an email, and aiding me in turning things around when getting programs into our school to educate and keep, our, um, keep, our, keep us federally legally compliant. In return, I got ignored and further angered. So this is my, so, so here it is, board members. My solution is simple. Every time you ignore my email, I'm going to come here and speak to you in person to tell you about the programs I am impl implementing in your school to keep everyone safe. Even if you don't care about LGBTQ, I care enough for all of us. And after Kathy will be Eric Johnson. My name is Katherine Johnson. I am the mother of Eric Johnson, who is the, in a relationship with Rachel. Two weeks ago to the day, we met with school officials at Christopher High School. We experienced multiple uh, judicial representatives, such as DA Gogo was there, even a representative from the Gilroy Unified School District, along with Principal and we discussed this particular situation. And to Freda's credit, 
She didn't ask for anything unreasonable. As a parent, she asked what happened with this situation. We were very clearly told that due to privacy, there was nothing that could be told to Freda about what happened to the students. Even after videos were provided, the police were involved. She was not allowed to know the outcome of this investigation. So I have here some of our board regulations, board policies for the Gilroy Unified School District. This is a lot of information. If you guys haven't read it, go out to the Gilroy Unified School District. All of them are right there for you. I understand that this is a lot of information for people to go through. So I'm going to boil it down for you. In a situation where there is discriminatory harassment, intimidation, retaliation, or bullying, any school employee who observes it or to whom such an incident is reported shall report the incident to the compliance officer or principal within a school day whether or not the alleged victim files a complaint. When a report of unlawful discrimination, including discriminatory harassment, and I'm going to skip through some words here, uh, is submitted or received by the principal or compliance officer, he shall inform the student or parent or guardian of the right to file a formal complaint pursuant to the provisions in Administrative Regulation 1312.3, the Uniform Complaint Procedures. That was not informed to either Rachel nor Freda. Even if the ch student chooses not to file a complaint, the principal or compliance officer shall implement seconds, imme please. immediate measures necessary to, to stop the discrimination and ensure all students have access. The uniform complaint procedure states that the corrective actions will be provided to the person who complained. None of these actions occurred. How can you keep Rachel safe, keep Eric safe? keep the other students at the Christopher High School safe if we can't even follow our own regulations and procedures. Thank you. And last, Eric Johnson. Hello, I'm Eric Johnson. I'm a, I'm a transgender student at CHS, Christopher High School, and I just wanted to address the board and ask, why does my life matter less than anyone else's? My community, the LGBT community, has been shaken after what happened to Rachel, my girlfriend. Everyone is terrified now, and we have no recognition of ourselves in the school, and we feel helpless because no one there is going to help us. We have, not, we have no mentions of LGBT rights on the school website anywhere, we have one poster in the entire school that mentions anything about LGBT students. My girlfriend was a victim of a hate crime and we had no information surrounding it. The person who attacked her, both people who attacked her, now walk around the school lording it over everyone because they know they will no longer get in trouble even if they assault someone with a deadly weapon, like a vehicle. So. I just want to know, why do I matter less than other students do? Why are my friends terrified to walk home by themselves because they live less than a mile from the school, but they know there are people after them? Why do I need to have my friends follow my girlfriend around school so that they know that she gets to class safe? Because no one else is checking on her, even after three separate attacks on her life. Why am I afraid to, to come out to tell everybody that I am transgender because I am afraid that the students will attack me and nothing will be done. I am afraid that if we don't get those, if we don't let the corrections that are being held against these people who attack us go, that we aren't going to get to a place that we can actually realize that, hey, LGBT students exist and we have rights. We demand to be seen. And we want you to, we want to feel protected. We don't want to be the enemies of the school board, but it's coming to the point where we don't know if we can trust you. All my friends begged me to represent us here because they want to know that someone cares. 
I, I'm begging for a response from someone after five emails that led to nothing. We are all shaken and we are stuck in the shadows. Please let us into the light and respond to emails to talk about the hate crimes. Represent LGBT plus students. I don't want to matter less than any of my friends do. And my friends are not supposed to be victims just because of who they love. Thank you. The next part of our agenda is a report of action taken in closed session. The board in closed session voted seven to zero to release notices to three temporary certificated staff. And in the matter of case 2017-14, the board in closed session voted seven to zero in favor of the stipulated suspended expulsion. Next, we have reports to the board and we'll begin with student board member report, Virginia Diaz from Dr. T.J. Owens, Gilroy Early College Academy. Good evening, Board of Trustees and members of the community. I'm Virginia Diaz Lazaro from Dr. T.J. Owens, Gilroy Early College Academy. Big mouthful, but you could just call it GECA. <laughs> And tonight I'm presenting on GECA and the Migrant Education Program. So first off, I want to report on the Migrant Education Program. They open their Camp Ochoa on April 25th. They have about 100 families on the camp. And the camp offers after-school programs and activities for the children that live there. The Migrant Education Program also got Easter baskets donated. And this was just a nice treat for students because a lot of the children that are part of the Migrant Education Program don't have the economic resources to sometimes afford simple and special little things like these. So this was just a nice treat for the students and their families. And the Migrant Ed Program also got My New Red Shoes grant. So all of the Migrant Ed students will receive a brand new pair of shoes for the next school year. And they will also receive a $50 gift card to Old Navy. So they have a nice new outfit with, to go with their new shoes. And the Migrant Ed Program collabed with DLAC and they put on Parent University. And it was just a presentation to show parents strategies to help support their students both emotionally, educationally, and socially. And the Migrant Ed Program also offers tours for students and their families. And they went to San Jose State over the weekend and they took again, both middle school, high school students and their parents so that they could see a four-year university campus and know their options and what is available on the campus and to support their students. And I had the pleasure to visit one of the migrant ed preschool programs at Elliott. I got to visit Miss Marcos class, which has three and four-year-olds, and it was amazing. It was incredible. These are small little humans who are so energetic. They're just... They're adorable little kids. And I got to see the SEAL strategy implementation firsthand. These children have letter recognition. They know how to spell their names. They know how to write their names, their drawing. They're incredible. They're incredible. You guys, I'm sure you have all seen it. I'm sure you have all been there. So I had a pleasure, and it was amazing. And I would love to go again. And. The Migrant Ed Program has been very busy and will be very busy, especially since a lot of families are still trickling into the district. And GECA has also been very busy. We had our week of kindness from the 10th to the 14th of April. And students wrote each other nice compliments and bags. And it was just to improve school climate and just have positive vibes on campus. And it's something that all students look forward to. We all enjoy just having some time taken out of class time to go and write nice things to one another. We also had ASB elections on the 14th and a lot of students participated and it was just a nice way for students to get involved in school government and a lot of the students were very creative so we have our ASB for the school year of 2017 and 2018. We also had the GECA talent show that night and students got to display their talents. We had diverse acts and it was well attended and it was just another nice way to unwind. 
We had a college info panel, so seniors answered questions for the freshmen. I was part of the panel, and we just got to give advice and answer their questions on college, scholarships, and classes to take while attending GECA. And then we had senior project presentations on the 21st and the 28th, and students presented their year-long project to panel. Thank you. Those of you who are there, we are very, I can speak for the seniors and say that we are very appreciative that you took time out of your busy schedule to listen to our presentations, so thank you. We have our junior and senior prom next <coughs> Friday, so we're very excited. It's one of the last senior activities, and it's just a nice way to relax and unwind. And we have CHP Impact Week, May 15th through the 18th, excuse my typo. And CHP will be presenting and raising awareness on distracted and reckless driving by teens. And I have a picture of one of our students because she is spearheading this event. We also have our GECA Science Fair on the 16th of this month and freshman students display their science projects to the whole school and we vote on the best science projects. And we have our senior class trip to Disneyland on the 19th. We are very excited, it is just last trip and before graduation. And then we have the GECA graduation on May 25th at the Gavlin Theater at 6 p.m. So can't wait to see you there. And the next day we have our Gavlin graduation for those of us receiving AAs, which is basically half of the senior class and I will be one of them. And I just wanna know that this is my last report to the board. So I just wanna say thank you to Mrs. Flores for appointing me and thank you for allowing me to sit with you. It's been incredible, amazing, and I've had a great time reporting to you. As you can tell, I'm always happy to be up here and report to you, and thank you for allowing me to sit with you. I've grown a lot as a student as a, and as a person, and you have all influenced me tremendously, that, so much so that I'm going to major in government, and I'm coming back for a seat, not, <laughs> yeah, I'm coming back for a seat, so, Watch out, Dr. Flores, it might be yours, it might be one of your members. Who knows, I'm just putting it out there that I will be back as more than just a student. And thank you just for allowing me to sit with you and be a part of this. I've, I want to come back and influence and make a difference in students' lives and education like you have made in mine. So thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Next, we have our superintendent's report. Dr. Flores. Thank you. I know, that's a, it's always so hard. I think we should switch the order. <laughs> so I go first, because they're so hard to follow. Anyway, um, I had a great site visit this week at Luigi Elementary and uh, walked the whole site with the principal, um, Mrs. Espinosa. And I am just so happy that we hired her. She is doing a great job. Wonderful new addition to our management team. And I got to see um, some new things that are happening at the school that I didn't know about from my last visit that is really, really good walkthrough. And we talked about a lot of things. Um, this week, we, uh, you saw uh, the recognition of Rotary. One of the things they do is they give out a lot of scholarships. You'll be seeing it at the senior awards ceremonies at the two high schools. Deb Padilla chaired the scholarship committee this year, and they did a great job. I understand we already have a list of who's being awarded the scholarship, so thank you. And we also had a, uh, we have a, a planning committee for our new school and Alvaro uh, represented me at that meeting as I was unable to attend. I've asked him to write up that process for you and we're gonna include it in my Sunday report just so you understand. It's a pretty involved process and a number of meetings involving a lot of people in the planning for the new school. And I just want you to know what that process is. So we'll be providing you some information about that as you Heard we've already, we've had some awards this month. It was great. Uh, so we had the Seal of Biliteracy Re Region 5 recognition, and I know a number of you attended that. We had the Glenn Hoffman Award at, for Gilroy High's Biomedical Science Academy on uh, April 26th. A number of us attended that event, and it was a great recognition. We're very proud of Gilroy High's uh, BSA program. And then um, today, 
I saw a picture earlier. A number of you <laughs> attended mm -hmm. the uh, California Gold Ribbon School Award and Title I Academic Achieving School Award for Solar Sano Middle School, and we'll be recognizing them here at a board meeting in the future. But that's just great that they were se selected, and they were selected. Uh, I was able to attend their presentation with the visiting team for uh, a signature practice that involves restorative justice, which they're just doing a great job with that program. So we're very excited about them receiving another uh, award. They, in the old days, it was called the Distinguished School Award, and they have already received that. We had a very uh, special event, Leadership Gilroy, uh, has what's called an education day every year here in the district. And we have a panel of administrators that speak, and I see we have a picture. Great. And so a number of our district, uh, our, three of our principals uh, were on the panel, Christopher I, Brownell, and Luigi. And then um, uh, as a debrief later in the day, most of cabinet sat uh, with, the, with the participants and answered questions. On the 22nd, as you already heard from Virginia, was Parent University, had a slightly different format this year. Instead of the parents going to a series of sm short workshops, they had a speaker who uh, I understand did a great job talking about uh, topics for parents on how to get involved in their students' education and things that they can do to support them. We have a number of upcoming events that I'd like you to know about. So the National Walk and Bike to School Day is the same day as Teacher Recognition, May 10th. Um, and a Walk and Bike to Work Day is May 11th. There's a May Fest at South Valley Middle School on May 11th. And then we have a whole bunch of events in one week. We have the retirement dinner on, I believe, Monday the 15th. And then Senior Awards Nights for Christopher High School on Tuesday the 16th and Gilroy High on May 17th. So that's going to be a busy week for us. Mm -hmm. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. This is kind of a roller coaster time of the year. Mm -hmm. We feel like we're on a roller coaster, right? Mm -hmm. Someday it'll come to a halting stop, <laughs> <laughs> but not for a few weeks. OK, uh, the consent agenda. I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, action information items. Report on the California Teachers Association Equity and Human Rights Conference. Members of the Gilroy Teachers Association will share their experiences from the conference. Or possibly the president, Vince Oberst, will be sharing <laughs> for them. Oh, good. Great. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have you guys be all right here. All right. All right. So I've, uh, I'm Vince Oberst. I'm the president for the Gilroy Teachers Association. Uh, I've asked these teachers to come tonight, and they will introduce themselves as they share with you about the Equity and Human Rights Conference. It'll be a little longer than the five-minute video that you avoided, but I felt this is important because uh, oftentimes CTA is seen as uh, political adversary, and CTA actually offers so much more to teachers than that, and this is one of the great trainings, the Equity and Human Rights Conference, and so uh, one of the things that, you know, there's a whole bunch, it was in, it's in the uh, packet, it's about diversity, social justice, addressing women's issues, training how to, you know, withstand attacks on public education, and a whole bunch of other things, so without further ado, I'd like these folks to share with you what they learned and their take-homes and that sort of thing. Hi, my name is Sheila Mauger. I'm an educational specialist at Rod Kelly and Luigi. Myself, as well as my colleagues Tina Fabella in the first grade DI and Haley Saldana in fourth grade DI, had the privilege to attend the Equity and Human Rights Conference. We're very grateful to have had this opportunity to represent Gilroy and Rod Kelly. We would also like to thank our principal, Mrs. Salcedo, for sending us as a team we were able to represent the lower grades, the upper grades, and student services, guaranteeing that every student will benefit from our experiences. We learned many fabulous strategies and statistics that reflect a need for systemic change. So, 
Hi, I'm Tina. Um, one of the workshops I attended inspired me to begin implementation of restorative circles in the classroom um, with both of my first grade DI classrooms. And this has given students a chance to talk about issues that are important to them at home and on the playground and in the classroom in the safest environment possible. Students are now listening more to each other and they're establishing new connections with each other and in so doing so they're also developing empathy. They are also learning about different perspectives as they share out their stories. Each meeting is an opportunity for my students to not only practice good listening skills, but also to engage in respectable responses. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many more strategies and practices to be learned, which is why we're hoping that we might have more opportunity to attend more professional development trainings on these subjects. Um, we are so grateful to attend the training as Rod Kelly will be implementing PBIS year one and tier one next year. Um, at this conference, we were introduced to the basics of PBIS. We're looking forward to more trainings and support for PBIS, especially when it comes to tier two, tier three support for students whose needs aren't met by tier one. We attended a session on teaching empathy in schools. We understand that our roles are not just to teach students academically, but to respond to their social and emotional needs as well. And one takeaway we had was a quote that I wrote um, from one of our speakers. And she said, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is a connection. And we anticipate making connections and strengthening our school um, culture and community in the future. Hi, I'm Matt Hungerford, Gilroy High School. Uh, this was my first ever CTA conference, and I want to thank you all for helping us get there. It was spectacular. Um, my focus uh, for the workshops I went to was on LGBTQ plus uh, students, um, working with uh, correct pronouns, how to incorporate them, make them feel safe in the classrooms. Um, I want to make sure you know there is a LGBTQ conference coming up in December in San Jose, also sponsored by CTA, and I encourage you to spend uh, a large number of teachers there. It was a spectacular conference. Thank you very much. Um, Megan Hungerford, also Gilroy High School. Um, I also attended this conference. I was very grateful to be able to um, take some time on a Saturday to go up, and, or on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, actually. Most of it's on Saturday. And I got to go to multiple panels. I went also to the one on teaching empathy, which is really important. I teach mostly freshmen, so getting them to empathize with each other is something that's vitally needed. Um, I also attended um, a panel on adverse childhood events and how we can help molliate the effects of those on our students, and one on learning the laws about LGBTQ students. And I also attended the LGBTQ plus caucus and the women's caucus at eight in the morning on Saturday, having driven back up, or sorry, on Sunday, having driven back up, um, which was very well attended. And there was a lot of discussion about how to support um, all people of all genders, but particularly women and um, non-binary gender people, both as teachers, students, and other support staff in our schools. So I also, I was very lucky to attend the LGBTQ plus conference in last December, and I'm hoping to go again to the local one in San Jose this coming December as well. I think it's vitally important that we send as many people as possible from as many school sites as possible to help all of our students everywhere. So in closing, this was uh, paid for the district offered 10 scholarships, just like for the Good Teaching Conference. It was paid for through the uh, uh, educator effectiveness funds that the district has available. And this wouldn't have happened without, uh, first off, without the superintendent giving the go-ahead, and then without the hard work of Kathleen Bierman to get with me and organize and arrange to submit the proper paperwork with the right I's dotted and the right T's crossed so I didn't mess it all up because we have quite a few participants. So I'm very grateful to her and her secretary, Ryan Kelly, for pulling that off for us. And uh, as you can see, there's, there's some really great things that CTA has to offer. And so we're very grateful that you uh, put a little bit of money toward these sorts of trainings. Thank you. Thanks for coming.
Thank you very much. We know this is the end of a busy day of teaching, so thank you for coming this evening. Thank you for coming, students. <laughs> it is. It's great to see you here. <laughs> okay, we're going to continue with our agenda. Item 6B is Christopher High School Catamount Actors Theater. The acronym is CAT. Russia Trip Report. Dr. Kate Booth, CHS Theater Director, and CH students, staff, parents, will provide an update regarding a recent field trip to London, England, and Moscow, Russia. So, who are you first? Is this on? My live? <laughs> Woo! All right. Uh, we had a fantastic time. And we're going to go really fast so because we, we know you have a long meeting. But uh, we're just going to give you the highlights. It was an absolute blast. Exceeded all of our expectations. And we're going to start off with Anne-Marie. Hi. Uh, my name is Anne-Marie Hayes. I've been in drama for four years. And I played Beatrice in Much Do About Nothing. Um, starting off, so our trip kind of began in Gilroy when seven Russian students came and visited and had a home stay with us. I hosted two students. I hosted Alex and Maria, or also as they're known as Sasha and Marsha, because they have many different names. Um, at first, I was afraid that I've never hosted anyone, and I was afraid that we wouldn't have much in common. You know, all you hear about Russia is, oh, they're scary, the Cold War, um, Putin. <laughs> um, and that's all I could think of. And I was like, oh my gosh, what if these students are really mean? And I, or what if they don't like me? Or if I don't like them? But right when they came here and I was like, oh my God, they're not talking so much. Then I realized they were jet lagged. Um, and right when we had uh, our first little party, we had a taco party at the Yodoshrox house. Um, we instantly became friends. We all helped make um, dinner together, and then we, after eating, we sat in the living room and played a very intensive game of charades, <laughs> which surprisingly, we all have common topics to put down. So that was our first kind of connection. We're like, hey, we watch the same TV shows and read the same books and like the same music. And we kept trying to mess with each other by putting in like longer book titles or only like American ones that we read in school. The Garlic Lover's Cookbook. <laughs> Volume, Volume two. two. Volume two. That took the longest, but they, they got it. So, um, but instantly we all became friends and we were all making jokes and we quickly add each other on Instagram and Snapchat and then they followed ar us around in school and we got to show them all our classes. Um, we did a tour at Gavilan and we did workshops where we all got to, here we had a tableau where we thought of something that was happening and then we had to add on so this was a rock, a rock concert, and one by one we came on stage and added on to the picture. And we all had similar ideas, like someone singing, or we were all crazy fans, or someone was getting too crazy in the... Crushed. Yeah, they got crushed by the concert. Um, go fast there's anyways, <laughs> so, sorry. Um, and then we went hiking at Point Lobos, and we all got sunburned together. And we just constantly talked and had fun, took lots of pictures together, obviously. <laughs> Um, and that was kind of the point that we knew that we were really going to be welcomed in Russia. And we weren't scared anymore because we had friends waiting there for us. And right when we walked in, um, Barbara and Lisa were there waiting with posters to greet us. And then we had dinner together and we were talking as if we were just, we know each other our whole lives. We visited the school and we met all other students and not one moment was uncomfortable. It was crazy. There were some younger kids doing theater as well. This was our cafeteria lunch. It was amazing. Um, and 
We sat down and we talked about these stories that we had written previously. We shared out our common issues as teenagers, what we've been through, and we realized that even though we live across the world from each other, we all have common things that we go through. We all go through feeling self-conscious or um, going through heartbreak, and instantly we just became friends and again, shared numbers and everything. And even now, I feel like we all talk to them still. And so we've created lifelong friendships here. Hello. <clears throat> Ooh, sorry about that. Hello, my name is Leslie Napolis. I'm a senior at Christopher, and I played Sister Frances in Much Ado About Nothing. You know, you would think that being in a different country, language barriers would be an obvious concern, especially when the language is Russian, one completely unheard of in our culture. We seem to avoid that as being one of our fears going into this completely new experience. I noticed and, went and witnessed that theater culture is a major part of the society there in Moscow. And I was amazed at the fact that language seemed to not hinder our learning in any way. We viewed a production called Siegel by Anton Chekhov. You can assume that it was in Russian. Uh, even though I could not understand a single word of what they were saying, I could understand what they were feeling and the relationships between the characters without even understanding what words were coming out of their mouth. I learned something very important that day, that human connections aren't based on whether you can speak the language or not. It's based on the simple fact that we are human and our connections are much more complex than the words that are spoken from our mouths. I don't believe that I would have learned that lesson travel without traveling to Moscow, especially with my best friends and bonding with the students from Russia, who I hope will remain my lifelong friends. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm a senior from Christopher High School, obviously. Um, my name is Cassidy Andrews, and I played um, Sister Antonia in Much Ado About Nothing. And I'm here to talk to you guys about tourism and how fun it was there. Um, <laughs> so we first landed in London, and we had to take the tube to our apartment that we stayed at. And our apartment was really nice. Um, we had a really good time there. And um, the tube was really interesting because it was super packed and we had all of our suitcases and we were lugging them around and people were just trying to get home from work and we were able to see like the life there and just how people are. And um, we went to the Globe Theater the first day and um, that was incredible. It was crazy to just be there and be next to the Thames River in London, England and see just the beautiful architecture and um, Dr. Booth pointed out all the postmodernism in the um, architecture there. So that was really cool. So we learned a little lesson there. And um, then one of the things that stood out to me was um, we ate lunch at this little like restaurant. And um, I had a huge pizza, but we were sitting by the Thames and it was gorgeous. And there were like river boats going by and it was beautiful. And um, then one day we went to um, we went to St. Paul's Cathedral and that was that was, that's the globe. Um, <laughs> um, we went to St. Paul's Cathedral and um, that, was, that was really cool. We got another history lesson there in architecture. And um, then we went to Buckingham Palace and I kind of begged Dr. Booth to do that because we were all really tired, but that was definitely worth it. It was, it was gorgeous too. <laughs> it was worth it. And um, then we saw the parliament and we walked across that bridge and, um, and it was really nice. Um, then we landed in Russia after a three hour plane ride. And um, we, that, that trip was really eye-opening for all of us, um, more so than London, because the culture was completely different. And um, we went to a lot of theaters in Moscow, and we learned a lot about theater. And um, it was really great to expand my knowledge in that. And I've taken four years of drama, but that doesn't even compare to going to Moscow and learning about like a whole different culture and how they do theater there and how it influences us even just like high school students doing theater on our stage. Um, and then we went to the Kremlin and this was incredible. Um, it was just crazy to actually be there and be in a place where like that witnessed the Soviet regime that you learn about in your history classes in high school and it's amazing. And I remember we went to, um, we went to Red Square and I just remember standing in the middle of Red Square with the Kremlin over here and then St. Basil's Cathedral like right in front of me. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is, in, this is crazy. 
And um, I just want to say a massive thank you because this is my senior year. I'm graduating in four weeks, and this meant the absolute world to me. So thank you so much. You say in Russian it's spasiva. So spasiva, thank you so much. Uh, hello, my name is Owen Emerson, and the guy with the long hair in that photos are me. <laughs> <coughs> I play Conrad in Much Ado About Nothing, and just a point that she touched on that I, I found really surprising with all the different architecture in London and Moscow. Um, when we first landed in London, a lot of it was, as Dr. Booth gave us a lesson on, <clears throat> was postmodernism, where a lot of it was a mixture of um, Elizabethan with um, modern glass structures, and you would see like these palaces right next to like twisting glass um, architecture skyscrapers that like, were a piece of art yet functional. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and then that w then we went to Moscow, which was quite different. Um, we there was there was obvious. Um, when you walked into Russia, you saw the Soviet bloc, uh, where there was uh, concrete buildings of just blocks of concrete made to be functional. But then you would walk further into town, and then you would see beautiful, beautiful cathedrals. And seeing that even though like they were pressed under a regime where um, vanity wasn't like used or looked upon as good, you would still see these hints of culture and like like the deep rich history in there because there was like around the Kremlin was like specifically like beautiful amazing like there was just this wall around it and in the middle with like gardens and like statues it was just beautiful and getting to see like how like the culture affects the buildings and like just the place when you walk in you know that you're somewhere that has a deep history was just really amazing. Hi, um, I'm Allie McCaw. Who's first? Oh, wait, oh. Sai. I thought I was just kidding. Never mind. I'm really excited. So I just want to talk a little bit about the, oh, sorry. I'm Jacob Yoderschrock, and I played Benedict in Much Ado. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the different theaters that we were able to visit while we were in Moscow and London, just because we were a theater group. And um, for me, as someone who's hoping to go into theater as a director, um, those were some of the most valuable experiences we encountered. Um, in London, we visited the Globe Theater, as some of my friends have mentioned. Um, but at the Globe, we did a workshop with one of their tour guides um, who did some very interesting uh, activities with us with text. So he had us work with the lines that we knew from Much Ado and try to say them as though they were hilarious or really work on attacking each other with the lines. So that kind of exercise was really cool. The different levels of address. Oh, yes, and we learned this interesting idea about three different circles of addressing someone or something. So uh, this inner circle would be talking to yourself. So the second circle would be talking to someone else. And the third circle would be addressing the whole audience or just everything in general. So that was a really interesting concept for us, something that we hadn't uh, analyzed at all before. Um, when we were in Moscow, we visited a wide variety of theaters. Um, one of the first was the Praktika Theater, um, which was uh, kind of a smaller modern theater um, where we did a workshop with uh, somebody who had actually trained at the Moscow Art Theater, which is the theater of Moscow. Um, and so we did a, a bit of a movement workshop where we did some interesting movement exercises and some exercises that helped get us out of our shell a little bit. Um, as well as uh, we got to, working with this guy from the Moscow Art Theater was interesting just because we got to see uh, the real intensity that the people who are trained at that theater, uh, the intensity that they have about them. Um, after the visiting the uh, Praktika, we visited the Pushkin Theater, named after a very famous Russian poet who none of us had ever heard of. Um, but. One of the really cool things about the Pushkin was the tour guide mentioned to us that theater was actually a really big part of Russian culture, which wasn't something that we uh, had really understood up to that point. Uh, we, we knew that, that theater was important to them, but it, it turns out that everybody goes to see theater in Russia, and um, for, that, that, for us, that seemed a little bit foreign, because 
uh, theater isn't seen as something that everybody does here in the US. So that was really cool. Um, at the Slavic Anglo-American School, our sister school, we did a little storytelling workshop um, where we all told stories about um, our experiences. Their theme was overcoming, uh, overcoming yourself to become the best of yourself. So we all told stories um, and shared our stories about uh, things that we had overcome and then did a little tableau exercise with that. Um, later, we visited the Moscow Art Theater itself, which is something that very few people actually get to do um, in touring the classrooms. That's apparently something that they don't usually let people do, but we uh, had some connections, so we got to uh, see some of the classrooms and uh, visit the class, and we took a picture with a piano. <laughs> um, so that was really cool. And then in the Moscow Art Theater, we got to see the theater itself, and then also the dressing room of Stanislavski, who is the founder of our modern acting style, which was very cool for all of us. Then we visited the Bolshoi Theater where we saw a wonderful opera. It was a very ornate theater and um, it was really cool to see a large scale pro professional production like that. Um, and finally at the very end we got to pr perform at the Slavic Anglo-American School um, our performance of Much Ado cut a little bit and that was a really cool experience as well. Sorry, I got really excited before. Um, <laughs> I'm Ali McCaw, I'm, I'm a senior at CHS, and it's my first year in drama. So this is a really cool experience for me as my first year and last year. Um, so our main kind of reason we were invited to Russia was for the International Shakespeare Festival, um, which we got to, had the wonderful opportunity to perform at. Um, it was really cool to see all the different uh, performances because we thought that it was going to be like people like that had English as their first language um, performing, but it turns out it was all Russian students, and so um, they were all in English classes. So of course they sp all spoke English now. They all performed in English, but um, you could tell it was kind of difficult for them sometimes. But it was actually pretty amazing because. Um, they used a lot of uh, different effects, um, something that we didn't really have the opportunity to use because we were taking our show across the, the world. Um, but they were using um, music almost the entire time, projections, a lot of just random special effects and like really crazy lighting. Um, and it was really amazing to see how it's really very, very similar to our own um, theater. And um, it was amazing to see how they just really took the language. And even though they couldn't really understand what they were saying sometimes, they acted it out really, really well. And it was um, easy to understand them, even though they were having difficulty with that. Um, and it was amazing just the, seeing the challenge of it. And <coughs> they all thought that we spoke like beautiful, eloquent English, and <laughs> which is uh, always true, but <laughs> um, but but it was really awesome just to see uh, their experiences with English and versus ours, and just be in that Shakespeare festival and get to experience the culture there. Yeah, thank you. Hello, my name is Alondra Gonzalez, and I have been taking drama for um, four years at Christopher. I played sequel in Much Ado About Nothing. I would um, like to make you aware of the fact without this opportunity of traveling to London and Moscow, I would never otherwise been able to see these wonderful and amazing cities. I started at Christopher in the fall of 2013. I was really shy and didn't know anyone. I thought I'd never fit in, especially with a group of kids that seemed to be so confident. Throughout the years, I have have come to understand the meaning of our drama family. I am proud to say that Dr. Booth and the drama program allowed me to go in ways that I taught, taught me how to taught me how to function successfully in our society. Freshman year me never would have thought I would be given the opportunity to go across the country, the opportunity of a lifetime. So thank you for giving students like me a chance, a chance at exploring the world, not outside of the classroom, but with my family. And I'll just close by saying, 
everywhere we went, we were complimented on our students. And I'm not, I'm not just saying that because I want you to feel good about it. But literally, everywhere we went, people said, your students are intelligent, they're so friendly, they're polite, they're engaged. They kept engagement come up, came up many times, especially when we were at the, our sister school. Your students are engaged, they're curious. Um, and the things I noticed um, was that they were flexible because there were many times when, um, you know, plans changed or um, something happened at a different time than we thought or Gretchen walks really fast. Um, and, you know, we would go and then we'd be like, okay, let's consult the iPhone, which way Steve Jobs and we, okay, we go this way now and everybody was flexible. Um, get up at what we leave at 3 a.m. Um, to go to, uh, to Moscow and then we, we stayed up all night because we had to leave at two to come home. And um, these kids were just very flexible, didn't have a problem with anyone. Um, everybody was happy. Um, everyone just um, rolled with the punches and um, we didn't have any issues at all. So the final score was two countries, four workshops, five professional shows that we saw, eight theaters that we toured. 10 student shows we saw at the festival. We had 15 students. We had numerous historical and cultural landmarks and countless memories. So thank you very much, Spasiba. And Gretchen is now gonna pass out the lovely uh, Russian candy that we brought. See all those kids are left. You better help them. Students, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Booth. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Booth. Nice haircut. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Oops. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Oh, my God. What is this? No. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I know. I know. Okay, we're ready to move on. Um, we're on item <coughs> 6C, public dis AB 1200, public disclosure of collective bargaining agreement between GUSD and the Gilroy Teachers Association. This is an information item. And Assistant Superintendent for Business Services, Alvaro Mesa will prevent, present the public disclosure <coughs> of the collective bargaining agreement with GTA. Thank you. Thank, hi, good evening, board. Good evening, superintendent and uh, members of the audience. Uh, this is an informational item, as uh, Trustee Midgard has just uh, discussed. Um, and it's related to the subsequent item. So uh, the flow is that uh, this is the public disclosure section, and then the subsequent item is actually the approval of the tentative agreement. Um, as you know, AB 1200 requires us to disclose to the public, um, to the public the costs associated with a known uh, bargaining unit agreement before uh, it binds the district uh, for those associated costs. Uh, according to the Ed Code and Government Section and AB 2756, Dr. Flores and I certify that we can um, meet the obligations outlined in the tentative agreement um, and the disclosure forms have been included in your packet. Uh, we certify that we can meet these obligations on Tuesday, April 18th. I uh, provided the forms, required forms, to the county office on uh, April 19th, um, and their letter, review letter, is included in your packet as well. The cost of the agreement, um, the total um, uh, cost of a 4.5% total compensation increase to the GTA bargaining unit is two million three hundred and sixty one thousand nine hundred and ninety as you know it's broken up into two key elements a two percent salary increase retroactive to july 1st of 2016 
and the rest is the equivalent of a 2.5% um, medical uh, benefit contribution increases to the medical plans for the bargaining unit for a total, again, of $2.3 million. Um, those are the costs associated with the agreement. Now, the agreement also includes a three-year pilot uh, for the uh, evaluation tool. That will be discussed uh, a little bit further with the tentative agreement in the subsequent item. Any questions on the cost? The MYP uh, multi-year projection has also been included in your packet. Mm -hmm. As you can see, uh, we are uh, going to be able to meet our uh, obligation and our board uh, reserve threshold of 7% in the current and subsequent years. Thank you. Questions, trustees? Thank, Thank you, you very much. It's an information item. Item 6D, approved tentative agreement between the Gilroy Teachers Association and GUSD for 2016-17, and this is an action item. And Stephanie Totter, Assistant Superintendent for Human Res Resources, will introduce this item for board action. Good evening, board president, board members, and Superintendent Flores. I've also asked Paul Winslow, another member of our negotiation team, we're going to highlight briefly for you the changes in the tentative agreement that we will be asking for approval at the end. Um, as you can tell, the Gilroy, the Gilroy Teachers Association and Gilroy Unified School District reached a tentative agreement for 2016-2017 on April 10, 2017. The tentative agreement has been ratified by Gilroy Teachers Association membership. Um, Mr. Mesa did um, disclose with you the public disclosure of the agreement, and now we want to go through. There were five articles that were um, discussed um, during negotiations. Negotiations took over 10 plus days. Um, I want to commend um, GTA for hanging in there with us and trying to work through, at times, very difficult conversations. But I, do, I am very proud of the tentative agreement that the team was able to come to um, closure with on April 10th. Um, so I want to briefly um, give you some highlights of Article 12. Um, we're only looking at sharing with you the changes actually in the contract. One of them was that we, would, we agreed to include some language related to requirements for teachers regarding website, newsletter, or calendar, um, and no requirement to use parent volunteers. Unit members would control any schedule that was related to parent volunteers being used in their classroom. We also, um, uh, we've had our, we have PE, itinerant PE teachers who travel from school to school. Um, over several years, we've been working through um, providing them with um, uh, uh, materials and supplies and then also giving them travel time. Um, we did agree to, to pay the elementary itinerant PE teachers, specialists retroactive back to July 1 at a non-instructional rate for a travel time of 45 minutes per day to really compensate them for the time that they um, uh, take to travel and carry some materials. But we are working very closely, and our goal is by the, this fall that there's actually storage on each campus. For them, they have the, the materials that they need, and we can continue to improve our, our PE program at the elementary level. Also in Article 12, um, we, um, we did have, what you see in the chart that um, is in your packet, we, we did have some other agreements that happened prior to that time, and I just want to highlight those for you. We did clarify that um, both tra transitional K through grades um, uh, 8, everyone will have their fall conferences and at the same time. That's been in place, and so we needed to change the, the um, contract language. We also now are including our academic coordinators, our high school athletic directors, and our newly um, athletic trainers, that they do receive 13 additional school days because they're the events that they work on actually start the very beginning of August. Um, with they are now, instead of 186 days, they work 199. Um, we also, um, the district and GTA had agreed, jo agreed to jointly evaluate the effectiveness of the staff developments that are occurring. The survey now shall be completed no later than March 15th to allow for the anal analysis of the data for development of the 
Local Control Accountability Plan, also known as LCAP. So those are the changes in Article 12. I'm going to ask Paul to highlight Article 14, Evaluation. Good evening, board members and Dr. Flores. Thank you so much for having me here. I also want to echo what Assistant Superintendent um, Stephanie Totter mentioned and, and thank the GTA, especially you know, President Vince Obrist and his team for all the hard work that they, um, they went through to come to this tentative agreement, which I think is in the best interest of, of everybody, and congratulations to, to, to Vince. Um, I want to talk quickly about the highlights of Article 14 and what has changed. Article 14 is the teacher evaluation document. So we did come in the tentative agreement to a three-year pilot of this new research-based um, evaluation model that we feel is going to not only be effective, but comes from research as well as analysis of other collective bargaining agreements throughout not only the Bay Area, but the state of California. The first major change is the observation form itself. We have, ups we have updated all of these standards uh, the current standards are about 15 years old in our evaluation document, so we're now including the newest standards. And instead of a yes or no check system that the current evaluation uses, we're looking toward a more rubric or a continuum, so clear language that shows teachers. Um, and it's modeled after the bits of programs in the universities and their current model of how they address the current standards. We've also looked at job-specific continuums. Current evaluation really is teacher-centered and doesn't include the non-classroom teachers. So with the GTA and with our team, we came to agreement on looking at additional continuums that are very specific to counselors or specific to nurses and jobs that aren't necessarily under the teaching profession but are um, under the umbrella of GTA. We also um, agreed to some very clear and transparent forms that will drive the conversations that administrators can have with teachers. Those forms are um, an attempt to create a consistent methodology of how administrators can work with teachers to improve their practice. We also are really focusing on how we create goals and how um, teachers in particular can establish goals that relate to the CSTPs or the Standards for the Teaching Profession and start to move forward within that continuum. We're also um, changing the concept of how we provide support for teachers. The current program improvement plan is now going to be called a certificated employee uh, growth plan. And that growth plan is inspired to provide additional support for teachers to grow and to remove the punitive stigma of that growth model. And there are several other small changes in particular timelines that are going to allow not only the teacher but the administrator flexibility to work with the new document. So we're very excited about the TA and the three-year pilot's going to be a lot of work, but we're very confident that we can uh, move forward and make the, uh, the spirit of the TA really flesh out over the next three years. The, last, the next article is Article 15. Um, basically, what we did is, um, it, over the last couple of years, um, Vince Olbrich and I have been working, uh, dealing with various issues, and one of those was really to uh, confirm how, when teachers take um, additional students in their classroom, particularly related to student enrollment, how they would be compensated. And so um, across the board, um, when a t affected cl regular classroom teacher um, is affected by having addi additional students over our planning numbers, I'll give you an example, like at first grade we plan for 26, but the, the teacher would be compensated if they had 28 or more students. And the basic um, formula, formula is $10 per day for each student over the students per the classroom. That now uh, not only applies at the elementary level, but has been clarified at the middle school level and the high school level. So that was one piece that we incorporated into the tentative agreement um, for this year. For Articles 23 and 25, Mr. Mesa really um, shared with you the information because that was salary and benefits. So as we move forward, what we're asking is that the board approve the tentative agreement between Gilroy Teachers Association and GUSD for the 16-17 school year. Questions before I call for the vote? Comments? 
Okay, I'll entertain a motion. This is an action item. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. The next item is also uh, Stephanie Totter. She will present to the board the declaration of need for fully qualified <laughs> educators for the 2017-2018 school year. Um, this article, this actually form um, comes to you on an annual basis. It's required by the California Teachers Commission on credentialing in order for us to be able to, um, when we find ourselves in a situation we, where we cannot recruit or hire all the fully credentialed teachers that we definitely need, it continues to be a challenge. You've heard from me in previous reports um, and you've heard the words of teacher shortage. But before we can grant an emergency permit in, um, HR, in human resources that can look like a short-term staff permit or a provisional instructional permit, the individual is not fully credentialed um, but can become the teacher of record. Um, and in order for us to be able to do that, um, the board each year has to approve the declaration of need for fully qualified educators, which is why I've brought it forward to you tonight. Um, basically what it's saying is uh, we make an annual de declaration that we will um, do our very best and do a diligent search to recruit a fully prepared teacher for the assignments that we need and need to be made. If a suitable, fully prepared teacher is not available in the school district, we will make a reasonable effort to recruit based on a priority that's been described. The first is we look for um, a, a teacher candidate who is enrolled in an intern program and we have utilized that venue over several years even before um, I came in as your assistant soup. After that then we're looking for someone who is um, searching out a teaching program and that's when we can put them on an emergency permit and during that time um, they search out getting in a program, we support them as they do try to enroll, um, but we can um, put them in the classroom for teaching. We're also required to provide support providers to really support them. They will have somebody from the university that supports them, but either at the site or throughout the district, we need to find someone to ensure that they have someone that they can, their resources would be there for them to be able to um, have a, someone to go to. So tonight what I ask you to do is to ap approve the um, declaration of need for fully qualified educators for the 17-18 school year. Questions? Now, are we limited to those numbers specifically? We couldn't go above them. It, it, so you, you uh, overestimate, what do you? Um, we can amend it if we find, what we usually do is um, look at what was the need last year, what vacancies do we have now, what we think the potential is, but you can submit um, an amendment if you needed more. Okay, so we're not, yeah. I don't think those are interesting. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, good question. I was wondering the same thing. Okay, uh, if there are no other questions, I'll entertain a motion. This is an action item. Move approval. Second. And moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Totter. Okay. Um, the next item on our agenda will be presented by our directors of elementary and secondary curriculum, Kathleen Bierman, Deb Padilla. Yeah. The staff will present the GUSD 2017-18 updated local control accountability plan for review by the Board of Education. Good evening, uh, President Mitgard, uh, members of the board, and Dr. Flores. So we're here to present our draft, our first draft of the Local Control Accountability Plan, known as LCAP. We promise it'll be amazing. Amazing <laughs> and short. We'll yes. try. Mm -hmm. Yes. That would be amazing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be amazing. I don't think we can uh, match the uh, wonderful presentation we heard about the Russia trip. But um, just so you know, we're going to give a brief background about some and summary of the plan process. Many of the actions and goals are going to be familiar to you as we're in the third year of LCAP. Um, so now at this point, we are in the implementation phase of the goals and actions. So we're refining them rather than creating a whole new set of actions. 
Um, just a little background. Uh, as you know, several years ago, 2013, a new funding formula was created called the LCFF, Local Control Funding Formula, and each district in California needed to create a plan as a result of that. It was designed to be a vehicle for transparency, to engage community and stakeholders, and so that part of the process is the outreach that we do every spring um, to acquaint our stakeholders with the goals and actions and to elicit their feedback. It is a three-year rolling plan, so this year becomes, you know, the year one and next year and so on. So each time you um, update that, um, we are given state priorities, and then it's up to us to make the district goals and actions that align with those. And also we are given from the state um, certain outcomes that we need to measure our plan by. Um, currently, the state has not finished its, its uh, rubric for evaluation. That is in process, and so we will look forward to receiving that. Um, and there are state and district me yes. metrics, many of those you are familiar with, such as suspension data, um, certainly our CASP results. All of those things are part of the process. And then it also includes an annual update for us to measure how are we doing. And you heard a mid-year review um, in February. Um, I will say that in this plan, I'm going to switch really briefly to the in your packet. You have the actual plan. No, I don't know how to switch to oh. Marie Bell. Oh, no, I don't know. Sorry, I wanted to show you that in the plan on page, uh, on the very first facing page, you'll see kind of how it's organized. Thank you. Um, so the part down here on the bottom where it says executive summary. So the executive summary um, highlights again some of the changes or actions that have occurred as well as our strengths and needs. And those are based on our analysis of our data um, and the state indicators. Now you'll see them displayed in in terms of that um, California dashboard that uh, Mr. Schrock showed you in one of our previous meetings. So that dashboard that had the indicators of the red and the orange and the yellow, but data again in various forms, not just CASP academic data, but suspension and um, dropout and, um, and um, um, EL growth, all those different indicators. Um, in the actual plan here, you'll see that the, the uh, actual goals start on page 46. That whole previous part is the budget summary and the annual update. And again, what is our process? We are required to document the process for stakeholder engagement. So now we need to go back to it. <laughs> yes, sir. Still you. Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, I, I think you've seen this graphic before that shows it's really a continuous process. And, and the part that, of course, is most important is the actual implementation. That is what's happening throughout the year. And you are getting updates throughout the year about um, some of those goals that we're working on. Um, and, but then we enter into this springtime process where we're engaging the stakeholders, presenting you with a draft, getting feedback from the county office, holding a public hearing, and then submitting it again. And so for stakeholder engagement, we tried a couple of new things based on the feedback that we received last year. And a lot of the feedback was that they wanted more opportunities for input and at various locations without necessarily having to go to additional meetings. So we worked with the principals to have more of the stakeholder input at the site. So uh, many of them had um, input time during their staff meetings. They also, during their school site councils and during their home and school club and ELAC meetings, they um, had time for our, um, our stakeholder feedback as well as the superintendent's advisory committee and our um, Angeles Sin Fronteras group all had time during their regularly scheduled meetings to do that. We also did the survey um, for the teachers, which next year will be done, sounds like before March 15th. This year would have been a challenge to do that since we had secondary staff development in March, um, but next year will, will be possible for us to get that done, um, which works for us as well because we wanted to move up the timeline anyway. 
So with this, in your packet, you do have the full PowerPoint that shows the trends and the information and survey results. So all of the information is included in your board packet, but we did want to highlight a couple of the key findings. So 96% of staff have incorporated knowledge learned during staff development days into their practice. Now this is not just our staff development days, these are also sessions that we have sponsored as you heard from CTA earlier, other workshops where they've been able to go um, and supported by the district to attend, so it's a variety of staff development opportunities. Uh, so we're still working on common core standards, so 68% um, of our students say that it's being implemented everywhere, so we've got a little bit of work to do. Uh, however, we're up to 81% of students that are accessing technology in their classrooms, so we're getting better on that one. 75% um, of our parents surveyed feel that they are valued as partners in their ch children's education. We also had a lot of additional input. So these were things that they had talked about that they would like to see in our plan. The good news for us was that most of these items are already in our plan. And like Kathleen said, it is a three-year plan, so we are in the implementation. So they may not have seen the results of them yet, but we are, in fact, working and on the implementation. So again, I think you've seen this uh, graphic as well. Remember that the state has eight state priorities and we have five LCAP goals. So as you can see, um, our five goals are incorporated into the um, priorities um, and they again are listed at the top in blue and then below that are the eight priorities from the state. Oh, oh, sorry. So um, just uh, what, one thing that you may notice is we've actually reordered the goals. We've switched the order between goal one and goal two. And the reason for that is to put an emphasis on the priority of providing high quality instruction um, to ensure that our students are college and career ready. Um, again, number one, about planning professional development. That is the process that we take very seriously and we engage all of our stakeholders in aligning that as well as the professional development plans that happen at the school site. So we're working with our principals to make sure what they're offering is reinforcing um, some of our goals and actions. And you're also aware that we have been in the process of of looking at adoption pilots and um, after a time when we were, weren't able to do so, we're back into that cycle, thankfully. And so as you know, uh, mathematics, uh, we did adopt programs for mathematics and provided professional development to our teachers. Now it's uh, English language arts for elementary, middle and high school and science at the high school level. So we're excited that we're able to do that. In addition, uh, we've established a K-12 NGSS implementation team. We're just kicking that off the ground, looking at articulation between our, um, our high school, middle school, and elementary to acquaint our teachers with uh, our elementary teachers with what that's all about and what it should look like in the classroom. And with this, we're also in the phase one of our um, career plan, and we are working on that. You will be getting a board report soon from um, Mr. Camacho Light, who's working on that, uh, to see our new plan. So we have decided that although Perkins has not updated and requested the plan, that ours is so old, it was written before Christopher was even built, that we're going to update it. So, so we are working on that now, and part of that is bringing in, um, or bringing back in, our community partners and our people in industry to give us guidance on what we need to do within our classes to prepare them for the current workforce. Uh, we're also looking at, as you have seen on our college readiness grant, that we are looking at different options and different tools right now that you'll be seeing again in a very future board meeting um, for recommendations of tools we can use with all students that can help students both in the classroom and at home to get more information on college and career options. We are also working to update our technology plan. Um, Maribel and Kay um, Gunther are going to be working on this because we are at the end of our three-year plan and it will need to be rewritten, which also means that we will be reinstituting our um, tech advisory committee and getting people back together. And what we had three years ago is very different than what we have now. And so we need to completely redo that plan and start moving forward with our district. 
So goal two uh, was previously goal one, provide equitable support for all learners, and this goal addresses a variety of actions to ensure that every student receives appropriate support and resources are aligned. Um, in the elementary grades, you're very familiar with SEAL. Um, that is uh, one of our big actions that is occurring in five of our elementary schools to provide a foundation for our students. And then the continual process of looking at student growth and what, how we respond to the, the data that we analyze. A um, big area that we're very interested in is making sure that all of our, stu our teachers at the uh, primary, early primary grades receive proper training in terms of the uh, foundation for literacy. We know again that that has a huge impact on the future success of our learners. And so to being able to provide that learning to our, all of our teachers is one of our actions this year. And part of it is really working with our teachers. Obviously, we first have to have that quality instruction. Then as now we have that, now how do we intervene during that same class period? So we have been working with our teachers during staff development on how to differentiate, as well as a main focus, um, especially at secondary this year, has been integrating ELD within the curriculum. So we are looking at those types of interventions. Uh, you'll see also with middle school, they are looking at interventions during the school day. This year they had um, trials of different schedules of how to do that to make sure that all of our students are able to get support at their given level to move forward. So the middle school principals um, and teachers are working on coming up with a model of that they have reached consensus on that will work for English and math. And then next year we will start talking about the science component as well. Is still me? Yep. So also with this, um, we've talked and we mentioned last time um, with the textbook adoption about our A through G audit. It's making sure that all of our teachers are highly qualified, all of our material is current, and as well as looking at how many of our students are in fact meeting the A through G requirements. Now keep in mind it is our current junior class that is under the new graduation requirements that are the A through G default. So one thing that we do, and Kermit has presented this, we look at our math passage rate um, to kind of help us to see as a, as a guideline of where we're at and how many students are on track for that. We are also continuing to offer summer school for credit recovery for our students and we have expanded slightly instead of offering 12 different sections we are offering 14 to include some of our science classes especially biology um, for our students. We're also looking at um, this year we added the MAP um, benchmark for our ninth and 10th graders because now we no longer have a state assessment at either the ninth or 10th grade year. So we wanted to make sure that we had an internal measure that we could use to help us as we um, support our students in meeting the requirements that they will need to do for the CASP in the 11th grade year. One of our commitments is to a, a population of students that is increasing, actually, and that is the homeless uh, population of students. Um, so uh, trying to um, connect students to resources and um, also acquaint staff with what are their, the rights and privileges of those students and how we can make the transition smooth for them when they're uh, in, when they're in that situation. Um, this is part of the McKinney-Vento Act, um, but there are some new requirements within in that act that says that we need to provide professional development for all staff, that would be classified staff as well as, as teaching staff to understand those requirements and to gain an understanding of, of really what is happening with students so we can respond better to their needs. Okay, and as you know, one of the targeted groups in the LCAP are English learner students, so we have a lot of actions focused on supporting the needs of English learners. Uh, at the secondary level, we're in the second year of implementation of support for all teachers. First, we provided a lot of support to the actual EL specialists so that they were equipped to be able to provide um, information and coach teachers, but now we are working on implementing um, particularly integrated ELD at the secondary level, so our professional development is centered around that. And at all levels, we've been putting a lot of emphasis on monitoring, um, looking at it, uh, refining our monitoring tool for English learners and reclassified students to make sure that they uh, continue to grow and maintain their academic uh, progress. 
And with our school culture and climate, our schools do a lot of work around culture and climate. We have character counts, we have PBIS, we have restorative justice, we have Olveus, a lot of programs to help support our students and our staff to create that positive climate. Now we're going into the next phase of how do we really pull all of these things together and get a multi-tiered system so that they're all integrated and they're all working in unison together to support our students. So we are working with outside agencies to come together for that multi-tiered support system and to see how we can do a better job and also look at the models that are already out there to see what are they doing, how have they made it successful, and how do we do it here in Gilroy so it really fits our needs. So one of the state's priorities as well as ours is to have high quality staff and uh, our desire and commitment is to provide support to both new and veteran teachers in a variety of ways and we're always seeking ways to make uh, how can we differentiate, how can we respond to different needs and I'm happy to hear from, uh, from our GTA that um, some of the professional development was valuable and so we'll continue to seek out uh, ways that we can support our new and veteran teachers. Oops, missed one. So our facilities, we have an incredible facilities plan that you have seen from Mr. Mesa for our district. And we know that we may not be there and you'll see on the survey results that our middle school um, group was not so encouraged about our facilities as some of our other groups, but we know it's already in the plan, and we know we are working toward that um, to make sure that all of our facilities are the best that they can be in the district. And we're also always updating our um, equipment and inventory needs, and especially in the areas of technology. And as we saw through this winter especially, we have an incredible maintenance department who is able to come back and you know, really immediately fix problems at our sites so that our schools can continue to run and function um, safely and comfortably for our students. For our next steps, we did send our draft, and again, I'm going to emphasize it's a draft, so some of you may say, wait a minute, there seems to be some questions here that weren't answered. That is correct. Mm -hmm. um, just like in our annual update, there are sections that are not done because we're not done with the school year quite yet, so we don't have all of that data. That will be coming back to you as you see in the June, um, when we bring it back in June, you'll see those sections complete. We have sent our draft to um, Santa Clara County Office of Education, and we've gotten some very positive feedback. Yes, some areas like that of, wait a minute, answer these questions, yes, we know, um, and always with questions on the budget, um, because when you're working with such a large budget and trying to fit it in the little boxes, it can be a little bit challenging. So we're working closely with them to make sure that we're reporting it in a way that they understand it as well. But so far, the um, feedback has been very positive. Um, we will have the public hearing here at the board June 1st, and ideally, if everything goes the way we hope, with um, approval coming around June 15th, we do in fact have time to bring it back um, because it will go back to the county. They do have the right to come back and say we need some more revisions. Then if that is the case after that June meeting, we will bring it back to you after we get their final feedback in July. So thank you for your time. We now have time for questions. Thank you very much. Questions, comments, board members? Well, I have a question. So if we have specific questions about this draft, could we forward those to you between now and June 1st? And Absolutely. Absolutely. It is an 84-page document. Yeah. So yeah. you may have a lot of questions about specific items mm -hmm. or specific actions. Yes, feel free to email us, and we can send you back our response. Um, before that June meeting, absolutely. Okay. And, and I was just curious, how do you feel about the percentage of um, either staff, students, or parents who responded? Yep. I want to just speak to one, one aspect of the Because I, I looked at your percentages and then I looked at the actual numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Except so, some of it I didn't yeah. have. I do want to say this is a challenge for us, because it, it, but we actually had an increase from last year. Um, we're trying different strategies. I, I'm going to speak just to the parent part, first of all, mm -hmm. because last year we had um, some schools heavily represented and then 
very little to nothing on other schools represented. And if clearly our goal is to engage stakeholders. It's really all those different, uh, representing right. different parts of our community. Mm -hmm. So we tried something a little different um, this year. I think it worked. I think we'd want to try it again next year where we actually sent home 12 third graders as a homework assignment, um, yeah. the survey, uh, in their packets so that at least we had maybe some likelihood. And we did get um, back more response for parents that uh, represented it. Because all they do is they check the, we, the the school, right? On the survey, the parents indicate the school. Um, so that that was um, better. We still have a lot of room to grow. And then you can, we can speak mm -hmm. about the staff. If, well, we also know we had um, feedback from some of the staff and some of the parents that, well, we gave our feedback at some of the committees already or some of the meetings, so we didn't do the survey as well. So we want to remind people that we really need it in both places um, because some of the things that are brought up in the survey may not necessarily come up in a meeting. So we still need to work on that outreach, and we still are heavier with some schools than we are with others, so we do need to make sure that we have a better cross-representation of everyone. So it is something on our radar that we did increase significantly this year in responses, but we want to do better than that. And, and how about staff? And I know staff includes teachers, paraprofessionals, um, and so same thing, we did have an increase that? in staff, but we do want more as well. Yeah. So, you know, I will, it's, I have put it on, on my list of things to do to work with um, Jonathan Bass when he comes in next year so that we can do a better job of working in cooperation and getting the survey co-written um, with support from our, um, our teachers association that will hopefully um, encourage more teachers to take the survey. Yeah, I, I was kind of surprised by the number of staff because this is their wheelhouse. This is what they do. This is their craft. This is their mm -hmm. art. And I would think we would have more responses, to be honest. Well, this is also the third year of a three-year plan, so True. they have seen it um, for two other years. So mm -hmm. I think that also some people say, well, you know, we've already seen this. We're still doing this. Mm -hmm. This isn't changing. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to remind them that the goals have not changed. However, the actions that are underneath have been updated. Some have been removed because we completed the old actions. Um, some we just know we're not going to get to, and then we've had added new ones based on their feedback. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to work a little bit more on getting that out to the teachers so that they see those differences. And you know, maybe it's doing that highlight section earlier you know, to say, Here's, here are the changes from last year. So we want to see the same type of changes each year. Um, whether it's a new plan or whether it's an update of a plan. Just to piggyback on that, I actually was kind of surprised, pleasantly surprised, about the 330 certificated staff and that they are pretty much evenly distributed, mm -hmm. elementary, middle, and high. I, that's, I think we have about 600 certificated staff at Correct. this point. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a little more than half. And teacher-wise, that's... Absolutely, more than half. Um, for a survey, I think that's pretty good. Um, classified staff at 27, paraeducators at five, not so much. Mm -hmm. And even 12 administrators. Mm -hmm. Come on, administrators. Admin's got to get in there a little bit more than that, too. Mm -hmm. But um, I think we are making you know, headway. Mm -hmm. And I was pleased with the 330 certificated staff. I thought that was a really good showing. Still not enough. Mm -hmm. Good that you still have goals for next year, mm -hmm. but um, I'm I'm impressed with that number. I have a question about the three years. Mm -hmm. So we are going into our third year. Mm -hmm. So next year at this time, do we scrap it and start all over again, or is it a continual it's tweaking? Yes, it's a continual tweaking. So. Uh, that's right. We're always right. in year one. So, yes. one. so the first year really was the most important one because Correct. that was the foundation. Correct. Right. And as you'll see, the state has changed the template. I know um, Trustee Pace loves that. So mm -hmm. it's changed every year. Mm -hmm. And also, as Kathleen mentioned, they um, we are in the third year and we have yet to get the rubric from the state. So we are going to get that. And I do believe there will be some changes based on that when we actually have the rubric in front of us of what they're going to be evaluating on. Sure. So I think next year will be, we are told we will have that rubric. So I think next year will be um, a possibility for maybe a few more major changes based on what we see in that rubric. 
I'm glad that you're hopeful that we are going to I get a I am hopeful. Next year. I'm right. always hopeful. It's always good to be hopeful. <laughs> I, did, I did want to uh, commend our, our, our secondary schools really made a push for the student responses. So you saw the student yeah. responses, 1800. Yes. That was really that was positive. Good. And, you know, they have good things to say. And mm -hmm. it's really, I mean, it's great that we can listen to them and respond to that. So uh, it was really because of the principals reaching out and um, mm -hmm. teachers that we got those responses. Mm -hmm. So is the survey also online? Oh, yes. It's on the website. Yes. So it's there. I'm just trying to think. Well, of it's not now. It's not closed. It's closed <laughs> for this <laughs> right. year. Not but now. yes, next year it'll right. be up on the website. We also had paper copies um, for some of our groups that are not um, as comfortable with the technology. And then mm -hmm. we took those paper copies and we inputted them for them. Sure. I mean, we have to think of the whole spectrum. Right. Mm -hmm. The whole continuum. So. Okay, mm -hmm. great. So you're an app, maybe. Huh? An app. <laughs> we, we could do that. We'll do a phone app and see. Well, I know we'll get more student responses yeah. that way, so I'll work on that. <laughs> okay, so you have the timeline. and Oh, I'm sorry, Trustee Rosso. Um, I have a question. on In the action that relates to, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm trying to read off of my different devices here. <laughs> In goal one, where it references specifically uh, the, uh, let's see, here it is. Um, annual measurable outcomes, let's see. Actions and services, elementary. Uh, it ref refers that assesses uh, second to fifth grade students performing below level two to three times a year. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that currently our practice? So um, at some schools, uh, we that that's one of our revisions. We used to say using Fontas and Pinnell, so um, not all schools use Fontas and Pinnell to assess the students that are uh, below grade level, but we do use some form of assessment. We'd like to systematize that a little bit more. Um, so we, um, of course, do it for our early primary, but any student who is about two years below, we are doing progress monitoring. The, the, the issue right now is that it isn't the same across all of our sites. Okay, so how are we going to make that a consistent practice throughout the district? So um, again, some of our schools have the Fontas and Pinnell intervention kits, which um, are for the upper grades, and some of them don't. Um, we don't have a problem with providing that resource, but we need to provide the training for them, and then we need to provide the time for that to have happen. So at some of our school sites, you know, we can work with the literacy facilitators, which actually usually do take a big role in that. Um, but our classroom teachers are doing that. Like I say, it's just that we, what we need to do is bring those people together and say, what, what measure are we all going to agree upon? If they want to go beyond that, that's great, but what measure is that? In addition, you know, um, Mr. Schrock always provides the benchmark data to the principals, and so then when we go through that process, we highlight the students that are in the lower bands, and then the principals go back and they work with their teachers on that. But it is, a, it is a goal that we want to be able to have a better system so that we can all be talking the same language. Okay, but I, I guess I know it's a target. It's something that we're saying is our, I guess, our uh, plan, right? Yes. And so, how long would it take to get to that point for our district? Well, this year, like I said, we had two schools piloting the Fontas and Pinnell as an intervention and actually doing that. And so, you know, um, one of the principals is going to be reporting to the other principals about how that went. If, if you know, if everybody comes to agreement and says we want to do that, then, then we would meet, move forward with that. I think we've had some challenges, in fact, in, you know, as far as the training for that particular program, it's, it requires... Um, a considerable amount of training. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't choose another measure to use. Can I ask for a yep. point of clarification, Jaime? Are you asking about are we assessing all of them well, or are we providing no, I'm interventions? I'm referring to the kids that are below uh, level, uh, that are performing below level uh, in second to fifth grade students performing below level, which is exactly what it says in mm -hmm. the plan. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm saying, are we 
uh, I, I realize we're not there yet. That's the plan. Mm -hmm. So at what point will the plan be in place or do we have we allocated enough resources to assure that that will happen or is this only a goal? Well, we are assessing them. I think uh, the, 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 the question, as I say, is getting one that's a consistent measure. We are assessing the students, so that part of it is happening, but getting a consistent measure so that we can all um, look at the same data in the same way. Um, so it, it is it is a part of the it is a part of the actions that we're committed to doing. Um, you know, intervention as you saw is is big K twelve mm -hmm. that we continue to to work for. Um, I think it's a question of resources, training, time, and coming to some agreements about what 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 we should be doing. How can we approach that? Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I know we'll be discussing this again, so. Okay. So, board member reports. Hello, anybody down there? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's so court that I'm going to be really busy this month. <laughs> yeah, it is yeah. a busy month. I'll be spending a lot of time with all you lovely people. I'm looking forward to this month. It'll be very exciting. Yeah, a lot of good things happening. BC, you look like you're dying to give a report on the gold ribbon ceremony. Say we've been to a, a few award ceremonies. <laughs> yes. Uh, some open house. I'm sorry. With the open house at uh, Antonio Del Bono, um, it's just real busy. <laughs> yeah, and I'm looking forward to it. Would you like to say a few words about the awards that we attended today? Well, it it was very nice. It was uh, entertaining. Uh, I it was kind of a different from the other award ceremonies we attended. Usually they pass out the awards while we're watching. This time they pass them out first before we got there. Right. But I can understand there was a lot of schools to, that received awards. But it it, um, it went very smoothly. I liked the keynote speaker that they had. And uh, I enjoyed it. Yes. So this was, um, Solarzano was given the recognition as a gold ribbon school from the state, from the California Department of Education. And a Title I academic right. achievement. So it was... Really well done. We're really proud of Solarzano. So, BC and Jaime and Linda and I were able to attend. So that was that was very nice. And Deb for the up. And I'm sorry, Deb was there. She was sitting right next to us. <laughs> and the principal and the assistant principal at Solarzano. Maria Walker and Charlotte Mittman. So, very nicely done. We're really proud of them. It's quite an honor. Mm -hmm. And so. You know, for Santa Clara County, how many were there all together? Seven, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Six? Yeah. yeah right. So that was great. And what else is happening? Talk about the Hoffman Award. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, let's see. Who all was there for that? Most of us Most were. Of us. Except Just me. Yeah. <laughs> she had to go to a to baseball a game. I'm sorry. I had to go to a Dodger game. <laughs> <laughs> you had to go to a Giants game. I did, and we beat them, so that was worth it. <laughs> So, Heather, would you like to talk about the Hoffman Award ceremony that we went to? Again, Gilroy was very well represented in a very small group of Hoffman Award recipients. It was a really lovely dinner, and they had videos of, of each school and some very, very impressive things going on at schools in our county. It was very uh, enlightening to see the good works that people have been doing to support their students. And Gilroy really stood out with that excellent program at, at the high school. Um, but boy, that the, the school that had the dentist chair in the school. Exactly. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That was cool. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was yeah. Yeah, some, So we were, it, it was, um, I think, a, a total of six schools, correct? And four. What was that? Gosh, yeah. four schools. And Gilroy was one of them, so congratulations, Gilroy. It's very exciting. Actually, Gilroy High, I think, was the only school from Northern California. The other three were all from Southern California. Well, we had the high school program, the 
biomedical, biomedical science right. academy, right. and that was being recognized. And then that was, you know, when you consider all the schools, that was very special recognition, and it was very well done. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was very so nice. staff was represented well. You really thought the dentist chair at the at the school was a good idea? <laughs> it was incredible. In the in the, in the discipline office. <laughs> Reduces exposure. Ah. Oh, and it's for children. It's not for adults. <laughs> yes, Jaime. Uh, I did want to share something. Um, I had the opportunity to be at the Brownell. Uh, uh, they had a, the uh, orientation for um, parents that were interested in the entering, kids entering into the GATE program. And uh, they had all the staff there. And um, uh, all the staff that works with the kids that are coming into the program that uh, were coming from the different schools. Uh, I happen to have a grandchild uh, at uh, Rucker and is going over there, so I wanted to see firsthand. Um, here's one of the schools he was considering. And they did an excellent presentation. It really was well done, well received by the parents. But I think the most impressive thing that I saw, they, they had a panel of uh, about uh, 12 students. And uh, after the teachers gave their presentation, and they, they were very uh, thorough in their, you know, I took a lot of notes. And, uh, but after, afterwards, the students each came up and made a presentation, and I was just, Really, I, I can't say I've seen more polished students, 12 of them. I mean, to me, they spoke like seniors in high school. They were really polished. They really spoke very highly of their experience. And, uh, and it was pretty, um, how many, you know, it, it was a little scary hearing at the start of the conversation about the challenge of what they were going to be expected to do. But, uh, but students came in, uh, you know, if you're willing to do the work and, uh, you know, that you're going to get help with the organization, you know, getting organized and uh, that it was really uh, well done. And I think I afterwards I wasn't sure if my, my grandson was going to be scared away or what, <laughs> but uh, he says no, I want to do it, you know. And so uh, I thought that was interesting, and I just have to say that it was really, it was, it was really well done. Thank you. Yes. Speaking of student presentations, the Gecka Senior Projects were incredibly. Um, amazing. <laughs> they were um, very professionally done. And um, I went last year and this year they improved. Um, I love that they wear business attire and come in in suits and dresses and heels and the whole nine yards and are quite professional in their presentations. They did a really, really good job. And by the way, and on so getting the, the invitation to the GECA graduation, if we could start getting the um, calendar for all the, for everything, I've got three things on that night on my calendar. I hope I've made a mistake. <laughs> because I have GECA graduation, El Roble Open House, yeah. and GUSD yeah. Elementary yeah. Choir. Yeah, yeah. probably true. All on the same the, evening. The problem yeah. this yeah. time of year is there are so many events, we do end up with multiple yeah. events. So, if we have those, I think we need to decide we who's should. going to we where. Yeah. Good idea. Gek is my school. <laughs> <laughs> it's a soft spot for me. <laughs> okay. okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. A lot going on. Okay, let's move on to upcoming and new referral agenda items. And I would just like to comment that we do have, if you look on the back of your little calendar that Gina has made that goes all the way to December for I've, us. I've got it. I'm very thoughtful of you, Gina. <laughs> She's trying to overwhelm Sorry. us. 
I'm sort um, of feeling like hi, Ms. Grants, and being overwhelmed. Yeah. yeah. The second page, future agenda items. Please don't think that we've forgotten your requests. And we have a few here that it looks like June is going to be kind of light that we can put in in June. Um, specifically, I, I believe, yes, uh, Trustee Good asked about board policy restricting employment of a former board member by the district for a certain time period. And then um, Mr. Rosso had previously asked about a GHS dance studio. Is that still an item, Jaime, that you wanted to have on a board agenda? Well, I'd, I'd like to have a, yeah, I'd like to hear about what we're doing at, at the school and is there a need for the facility or not? Okay. Is, can I... Uh, Maybe do some follow up in a weekly yes. report to start. Oh, absolutely. With. Okay, so not necessarily in a board agenda. Yeah. It doesn't at this point. Okay. Okay, good. And then, uh, so we have Mr. Goods and we have Mr. Russell's, and then we have um, music teacher's presentation to the board. Yeah, what happened? I think it's kind of on hold at their request, right? Yeah, they haven't uh, expressed an interest to do it. I so. Ask them again, but it Okay, that would be great if you could find out for us because I'm not sure what to do with that. Superintendent's evaluation process forms. Um, I think we did put that on. Um, well, our goal, James and I worked on a timeline the other day and actually we're in, well. That's right, it's May, people. It's May. Time to do it again. <laughs> well, are so, you talking about, my evaluation, yes, is due, but at one point, I think, uh, Linda, you had brought this up of revising the process and the forms for the future, right? That was which would be concerned. a public item, right? Versus my my evaluation, this would be a pub public discussion about the forms and the process. But I don't I don't know if you're ready to do that by the end of the year. We're running out of time. Probably not. Yeah. Okay. So maybe over the summer, two or three of you could work on it and be ready to go maybe in August. That would, yeah, be, that probably, would be good. That'd be better. Uh, budget priorities? We, we're coming, we uh, discussed this in cabinet and we'll be coming to you probably first in a weekly report with a proposed timeline. Okay. For that next year which would probably start in the fall with some discussion about you know priorities first from the board and I'm sure we'll get public input. And okay. then that needs to be done well before, say, January, when we start develop, you know, start the work on the development of the uh, budget. But okay. I believe Alvaro was going to come up with sort of a timeline that we could share with you. All right, that would be great. And then we have 2018 school board campaign. Linda and I are going to be meeting next week, and we'll put together a proposal for when we would like to go out and talk to parents at the sites next year, because in 2018 there'll be four seats vacant. That doesn't mean people are leaving, but some people are. So, you know, when we just have a one time a year, y'all come type meeting, nobody comes. Well, James, well, James came that time. sorry. That's how we found James. So, but you know, when you have a, a meeting like that to explain to people what the school board is all about, and you only get two parents, then, um, you know, so we're going to come up with a proposed timeline to show to you for next year. One of the best places to go is to the, the local school PTAs. Because Definitely. Those, those people have already, you know, apparent interest in what's uh -huh. happening in the schools. I would think that would be a good place to start the recruiting. Exactly. So we're going to put down schools and possible months that we'll go to those schools. And, yeah. and then we'll, because see, people have to file by August of 2018. So we have to start planting seeds in January. before that. In January, truly. Well, we might need a campaign. <laughs> no, I'm serious. A campaign at the school sites, basically to recruit school board members, you know, challenge them, people to step up and, yeah. and put their name forward to be considered. So we'll know. just come in with kind of a little timeline, and then we can go from there. People and then, need to know what happens behind the boardroom. It, it can be a big surprise. <laughs> Are well, you surprised? I was surprised. 
<laughs> the first board meeting and that first agenda packet was a big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how about uh, safe routes to school resolution and expansion to other I sites? I believe Mr. Rosso requested that, and I'd like to start with a one-on-one -on -one discussion about it before we bring it back to the board. Or you would like to yes, meet with because Yes, because cabinet, okay. we discussed it, and we have quite a few concerns about the resolution, so I think Jaime and I should start. Okay, that's fine. Okay. And I've had discussions with principals about it, so okay. we'll start there. And then we have the Alexander Place Apartment Student Safety to and from school. I think we we did list yeah. it on the agenda. That's um, on the, oh, good. The we, think we have it on, yeah. We can take I, it off. I hope here. we can the meet that deadline. Alvaro and I can talk about it. We, one of us needs to talk to the city about where they are on the project and when they plan to open it. That's one piece. And then we can talk some more about transportation. And, but we'll bring it to you on the, either the 18th okay. or the 1st of June. Okay, and then Mr. Good, if I could just have clarification, um, what would you like us to do with board policy restricting employment? Well, I, I, gave, I gave it to you in writing once. Yeah, we have, we have a written statement from you. A, a board policy prohibiting okay. employment of a former board member for two years post-separation from board. Right, and there are some districts that have that policy. Yeah, I was in so one can, that had a policy like that, and you mentioned, uh, was it Santa Clara Water District? Yeah, Santa Clara Valley Water District had, a, had an issue where they had a person on the board, and then the, the, the day after a board meeting, or, or so, or, you know, the, the CEO would be the superintendent in our case, uh, hired him as a highly paid official, and then he resigned from the board, mm -hmm. which was a surprise to a lot of the board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that's what that policy is intended to prevent. Yeah. Okay. I think we could ask legal counsel to help us with it. I know there are some public agencies that have policies All like right. that. So now, is there anything else you want us to add at this point? <laughs> Anybody? It might be August or next year before right. it gets added. I mean, that's the whole thing, right? Okay, so uh, the next regular meeting of the Board of Education will be, will be held on Thursday, May 18th, 2017 at 7810 Arroyo Circle, Gilroy. Closed session will be held at 530, followed by a study session at 6, and open session at 7. The agenda will be available on the district website by 5 p.m. on Friday, May 12th, 2017. Sorry, what? Um, when, uh, Debbie, I'm wondering if you can give us kind of an update on what's happening with the hiring process. Uh, I was uh, saying this earlier. I've, I've requested uh, Stephanie and Patty Jolly, who are uh, managing the process, to write a report. It's, they're already working on it, and you'll have it Sunday. And I, I think it'll answer a lot of your questions. The hiring process is going very well, thanks to their efforts. And some kind of timeline as Yes, to... they, there's a lot of information in the report they're preparing. We've already, we've already had some really good success. A great example is we've already hired five math teachers for Gilroy High. Remember, we started this year with two or three vacancies. Okay, and also um, updates about how the progress with the technology, uh, imp you know. Implementation? Imp yeah, what's oh, happening. Give you a update. You know, what's going on sure. with that. I know a lot is happening out there. We won't, probably won't have that for this Sunday, but. Right. Following Sunday we can That's do that. fine. Okay. Okay, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>